Welcome to That's the Word, Wholesome Tales for the Whole Family. I'm Father James Yamauchi. Today's story, The Eleventh Hour Intervention. 4.30 a.m. The cell doors open. Henry looked up to see the three men in the doorway, ready to escort him to his execution. Turning pale, he stood and went with them. His trial had been a national sensation. The investigation had been full of twists and turns, but he maintained his innocence despite all evidence pointing to the contrary. At the end of the trial, when asked if he had anything to say for himself, he only said, I am innocent. The verdict came back swift. Death. Now Henry approached his death. As he entered the courtyard, the shadow of the guillotine rose before him. The soldiers escorting him drew their swords. In spite of his surroundings, Henry maintained an air of bravado as he walked forward. However, as he got closer to the machine, his pace slowed. His air of confidence left him. Suddenly, Henry turned, grabbed something from one of the men who escorted him, and kissed it three times. It was a crucifix. A few minutes later, it was all over. Henry was dead. Elsewhere, a 14-year-old girl cried as she read the newspaper story. She wept and ran out of the room. But these were not tears of sorrow, but tears of joy and relief. Earlier, amid the media firestorm, this girl heard of the infamous Henry. She knew the charges, the triple homicide, even if he was innocent of the crime, as he maintained. The life he led was one of rampant depravity. Worst of all, he remained impenitent. She could not bear to think of this sad soul being lost to God. The young teenager employed all the spiritual means she could think of for his conversion. Knowing that conversion can happen, even without some perceivable indication, she nevertheless prayed for some small sign of reassurance that he did return to God. So when she saw this story in the newspaper, she was overjoyed. His kiss of the crucifix was the sign she had asked for. It was the first sinner that she had directly prayed for, a great sinner who appeared to repent at the last moment and who might yet be saved. This young girl of 14 had already lived more than half her life. The next year, at age 15, after much petitioning, she was permitted to enter Carmel and don the habit of the Discalced Carmelite nuns. While she often struggled in her pursuit of holiness, she achieved a great level of sanctity in her short life. Her autobiography, published posthumously, became a national bestseller, and her picture and habit made for one of the more unique photographs to feature in pilots' cockpits during the First World War. A little girl who made fervent prayer and petition for a murderer she never met, Henry Pranzini, and achieved sainthood in her own little way, St. Therese of Lisieux. And for this week, that's 
the Word. So, John Peter, you know well my devotion to St. Therese, and one of the great gifts of my life have been the opportunity to do the retreat that I'm required to do by canon law before being ordained a priest. I was able to do that during Holy Week in Lisieux, and so the hometown of St. Therese. Actually, she was born in another place called Alençon in France, but Lisieux was primarily where she grew up and eventually where she entered Carmel. And so to be able to pray at the Carmel, to spend time in her house, and of course to go to the Basilica, it was a great, great gift. And those who are very devoted to St. Therese are familiar with her intercession, especially for Henry Pranzini. But I don't think many people know the details of that trial, which we indicate in, in the story, was very popular at that time. Popular is one way to put it. Yeah, so, so maybe popular isn't the right way of saying it, but it was very um, notorious, I guess. It's one of these high-profile cases. Nowadays, you have high-profile cases that every news channel is covering constantly. Same thing back in the day where you had newspaper coverage of these stories, of these high-profile murders or whatever other crime was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. So this one was a triple homicide. This was a upper class lady of ill repute was um, murdered. You know, she was with a knife as well as her daughter of 12 and a servant girl. Okay. And the only clue was a cuff and belt with the name Gessler, which I'm not pronouncing properly, written on it. Pranzini is apprehended miles away in a place called Marseille because he's holding He's selling jewelry that belonged to the victim. They apprehend him and ship him back, but he has a alibi mm-hmm. from some other wo- woman of ill repute. He was hanging out with her that day. So the police don't have their suspect anymore, and they find a name or guy named Gessler. But this person that they found who's Gessler was actually Pranzini's former boss and one of the people who had fired him. They began to suspect that that name was just planted there. They did a handwriting analysis, found out that, yes, Pranzini's handwriting matched that. And the woman who had previously offered an alibi then retracted it and offered actually more evidence against Pranzini. Hmm. So that's where he ended up. That was where things stood when it went to trial with the investigation. Investigation was, again, media sensation. The verdict came back pretty quick of guilty. Hmm. So it was pretty much in the eyes of the public from the very beginning that this man was guilty, and then he was proven guilty in the court of law. It was that, and it was especially intriguing because he was initially cleared, and then the whole thing turned on its head. So great if you're a newspaper man looking for a fascinating story to keep your readers on edge. And this fell into the hands of the little Therese Martin living in Lisieux. And actually a side story is that she wasn't supposed to be reading the paper. She happened to see it, but it's amazing. And we were talking about this before recording her first instinct when the rest of society was condemning this man. And obviously he was convicted of a horrendous crime and was receiving justice. Nonetheless, she realized the, the need to save his soul and to pray for him that he would repent so that there is the hope of salvation for him. And I think that's a great lesson for us today. Right. When we hear from somebody in the news who has passed away, or, I mean, just we hear about somebody in the news, period. About half the time, we don't like the person in the news that's being reported on. But it's important that as Catholics, as Christians, our first response is to pray for their soul and pray for them. Because we all want... As St. Paul reminds Timothy, we all want what God wants, which is God desires all of us to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Something else fun that we just released recently is we made a full cast audio comedy, Peter and Chains, based off of Acts chapter 12. It's about 10 minutes long, and we think it's really funny. We hope you enjoy it. Father James narrates it. I wrote it. And we have an awesome cast who performs it. You can find this in the show notes, or if you go to YouTube and search for Thunder Rock, Peter and Chains. 
you'll be able to find it. Or you can go to our website under the news section. It will be there. If you enjoy That's the Word, please share the word. You can see the story extras for this story, The 11th Hour Intervention, at thunderrock.org, where you can see pictures of St. Therese of Lisieux at this time and Henry Pranzini's mugshot. It's really fascinating that we have pictures of St. Therese of Lisieux at this age. I remember the story from your seminary days when even then you had a devotion to St. Therese of Lisieux. You had a picture of her as a young girl on your dresser. One of the other seminarians came in and said, wow, she's beautiful. Who is she? That's right. That is a true story. And boy, was he surprised when I said that happens to be a canonized saint. Thunderrock.org is also where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter and where you can find our social links in our email if you have any feedback or story ideas. Thanks for listening and join us next Wednesday for another wholesome tale for the whole family.